Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Cisco. And this is Mike. And welcome to the Cisco and Mike Show. And today we have special guest Gil Carrillo in the house. He's actually a retired detective. <laughs> yeah, we need that little button. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you have hey, put, push, push the little button though. <laughs> no, oh, that's the last one. Yeah, just, just nice. impress it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, some of you guys may know Gil from uh, the Netflix special, The Night Stalker, from Crime Con. I know that's a big thing now, right? Crime Con, and like Crime Con was a big thing. True crime thing has really it's, taken off. It it has, you know. I did it. Uh, I was like a last minute fill in last year. Uh, I don't know what they were looking. You know, the down at the bottom, the pandemic was out, so they're fine. I got a phone call that just said, "Hey, would you mind if I gave your name? I think you'd be great for this stuff." And I said, "I don't care." And next thing I know, they're calling me up. Would you be interested? So they flew me out there. I went out there to Austin, Texas. And uh, I said, what do you want me to talk about? You know, he said, well, just talk about your your life, your career, you know, where it's gone. I said, all right, I can do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I go down there. And he says, because of the pandemic, we only have about 1,500 people here this year. And I said, okay, you know, hey, you guys get me out here. You know, this is on your dime. I'll, I'll get up there. So I talked and stood there a couple of days. And I came home, didn't go watch anybody else speak. Uh, because although they're crime enthusiasts and listen, they love listening to everybody else talk about the crime, since I lived it, I don't care much about it. You know, you know, it's it was a job. That case is no bigger than this case. Some of them are interesting to me. I want to hear, but because I had a good time over there, I, I I didn't feel like getting up in the morning and going to listen to somebody speak. And so I I asked somebody, uh, the guy that nominated gave my name up there. He says, well, are you going to come back next year? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> they invited me here this year. I didn't ask for this. And I don't know how they do their selection. He says, oh, you'll be back. He says, I don't know if you realize this. You're a rock star around here. Everybody loves you. They like the way you talk. You're so humble. You're this, you're that. And I said, man, I just, I am who I am. I ain't nobody mm -hmm. special. Next thing I know, uh, they're calling me back for this one in uh Vegas, I believe. It was, it was in Las Vegas. It was the end of May, uh, end of April, April 30th, then May 1st, 2nd, something like that. Uh, I said, okay, you know, that, that that's fine. But only, you know, we negotiated something out so everybody would be happy. And I said, what do you want me to talk about this year? He says, you can talk, do the same thing you did last year. <laughs> and I said, same thing. He says, yeah, hey, last year we had 1,500 people there. He says, this year we've already got over 5,000. And uh, he says, that means at least 3,500 haven't heard you talk. <laughs> he says, and those that did hear you talk, it's their decision if they want to go back and hear you again or, or not. Yeah. yeah. And so I said, all right, I'm in. And then they kept calling me, hey, we want you to do this while you're here. We want you to do this. And uh, I did it. Everything they asked of me, I did. And it was a great show, and, you know, they I did a podcast there. One of the first things I did, I got there in the afternoon, and, hey, all right, get your things in the room, let's go. And they whisked me off to a podcast, and I walked in there, and it's this great big hall. And they're literally, I don't know, because there were only so many seats, but they're all, there's hundreds of people standing around, it's all crowded, and I get up on stage and people start screaming, you know. And, <laughs> and these are two cops from back in the Midwest someplace that hold their own podcast. And they look at me and they're drinking bourbon. Mm, nice. and, and I told you, normally I'm a wine drinker, except for with George and, and not with you guys, <laughs> a, a little beer. But normally I'm a wine drinker. So I told them, I said, hey, you know, they said, what do you want to drink that day? I said, I drink wine, Cabernet. Said, All right. So I get there and they got big bottle of nice bourbon up there and they're just drinking it on the rocks and i walk in they said what do you think i said shit this is insanity because people are screaming and yelling and i said this is insanity forget the wine give me a glass of bourbon <laughs> you know we sat there we did and that started it for me and i mean people line up like you go to disneyland they have roped off area people lined up to sign autographs to take pictures Everywhere I went, uh, I told the wife, uh, at least a thousand people, you know, in walking around, hit me up for autographs or hit me up for, and I'm just sitting there riding this, this wave, brother, because I'm saying, hey, it's just me, you know, <laughs> yeah. nah. I'm, I'm nobody special. 
That's the way I truly feel. And and I, on the job, when people wanted to go to homicide and people that talk to me about, hey, can you give me consejos? I want to be a cop. And one of the first things I tell them is never forget where you came from. So I don't care who you are, what you do, never forget where you came from. And that's been a good one. So uh, I was, te- they asked me to speak. And the, the last day, it's Sunday morning. And I'm speaking at nine o'clock in the morning. I'm saying, who the hell's going to get up <laughs> Sunday at nine o'clock in the in morning? Vegas, in Vegas. In Vegas, man. I, I'm lucky if I'm in bed by nine o'clock in the morning. So I got up there and I spoke. And everything's done very, very professionally. I mean, it's. Uh, it, I think it's supported by uh, A&E, and they put all the money behind it, and everything is done professionally. You know, they have time clocks going for you, speaker, everything. And they said, okay, 45 minutes. And I asked them, you know, okay, here we go. So I got up there, and they asked me, what are you going to say? I said, shit, I don't know. I'll find out when I get up on stage. <laughs> and I got up there. And I spoke for 45 minutes, and there was enough time. I said, you know what? I, I asked you guys if you had any questions, you know, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, we've got about four or five minutes left. Anybody have any questions? And, yeah, they started asking questions. And I said, okay, that's it. It's time for me to get off stage. And I got a standing O. And so I'm sitting there saying, holy shit. I said, wait a minute. I grabbed my phone and I start filming them, you know, a standing ovation for <laughs> Fat Gil Carrillo. You know, this is this is good. So it, it's it's fun. It's yeah. gone good. I was just uh, in Chicago uh, earlier. Uh, let's see, we're in July now, so in June, I was in uh, Chicago, and it was a freebie. The guy, my hats off to Chicago Police Department. God bless them boys. Uh, they asked me if I'd go back there and do a fundraiser for wounded veterans. And for family, surviving family members of cops killed in the line of duty. Okay. And they send people out all over the United States, two cops, when a cop dies. And most recently, we just had the two cops from Almonte. Almonte, right here. Right next door. They sent two cops from Chicago out here to give each family $11,000. Nice. And so I went back there. Uh, That was a freebie. I mean, touched my heart. Ain't nothing. Let's just do this. And uh, made some good friends. Uh, just sent them a care package, uh, and mailing alone, it cost me to ship this <laughs> shit 115 bucks. <laughs> you know, but you gotta uh, use a third party shipper, bro. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> he's, he's, he ships all over the road. I ship all over the, all over the place. Is I sell right? stuff online. Oh, so I gotta find a cheap dog. I gotta, I gotta get that penny. Yeah, oh, a penny's uh, a penny. Shit, I just went to U, U, UPS, <laughs> <laughs> most they, expensive. They yeah. took my pennies, uh, <laughs> but um, it's funny because uh. You and I were having conversations on the phone, the old-fashioned way, I guess you can say. Yeah. And I was telling these guys that, man, you're, you you have this personality, this big personality. So I understand why you know you're a rock star to a lot of people when you talk. You kind of take control, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you're that center of the stage and you're full of life. I want to say one thing before we continue. Uh, we were talking about this before. You mentioned you served in Nam. I served in Vietnam. Uh, I went there. Uh, I turned uh, 18 November 29th, and February 1st I was in Vietnam. I flew, uh, got up around 1,200 hours in uh, combat flying over there as a crew chief on a uh, first an insertion, you know, putting in, taking out troops, medevac, everything. And then uh, last several months, I was on gunships where I just went in and had to do what we had to do, uh, come back, and it just changed my life. I, I came back. When I got out of the Army, I had three goals in life. One, I wanted to go to college. I knew I was mature because I had to send for my transcripts, and I was embarrassed when I saw them. I obviously <laughs> thought D stood for damn good and F was fabulous. <laughs> and the only reason they let me into Rio Hondo College is because I was a veteran. And so I wanted to go to college because at that time I thought only rich white people went to college, but I wanted to do this. Yeah. I wanted to become a cop. I wanted to give back uh, to someone what that cop gave to me, and he's, he saved my life. Number three. I wanted to hook up with my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> I say ex because she wrote me a Dear John when I was in Vietnam. Well, those suck. Oh, man, broke my heart. I was sad. I'm over there. And, yeah. And, you know, she didn't want me. You know, you're too far away. I found somebody else. Yeah, all right. 
So I wanted revenge, brother. <laughs> Latino blood was boiling. <laughs> I came out. I wanted to get her eaten out of the palm of my hand and then break it off on her. So I got out in June of 70. By September of 70, I had her right there eaten out of the palm of my hand. And the day after Christmas, booyah, we got married. <laughs> and, uh, it didn't work out as planned, huh? It didn't work out. Two out of three ain't bad. Hey, boy, I'll take that anyway. Yep. Hey. And, the, and the reason I brought the military stuff up is I wanted to say thank you. Yeah. Oh, um, thank you for your service. I'm right. also a veteran myself, so. God bless you. Thank uh, you for your service. Thank you. So you're welcome. Um, so I have love, just like just like you were saying about the wounded warriors um, yeah. and all that stuff. That that I take dear to my heart, and so I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you oh, uh, for serving, especially during Nam. I, I think Nam was probably one of the one of the conflicts that our military has served in that was the most fucked up because they didn't give a lot of credit to the the military personnel that they went to Nam, and a lot of a lot of people don't understand that it was one of the it was one of the it was probably the only draft war. Other than than World War Two and, and in World War Two everybody's volunteering to go. Yeah. 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 But Nam, it was like they 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 don't recognize they didn't recognize the when people didn't recognize the, the soldiers when they were coming back. The struggle. And at the same time, they weren't giving them no choice. So it's like, fuck that. You know what I'm saying? The only the only problem, you know, when I came back from Vietnam, you, you couldn't talk about it. You know, it was not popular. Everybody hated you. The the people that were protesting. Hated the troops. The troops were taking orders. You know, exactly. they, they're, they're just doing what their our government is telling them to do yeah. in order to make the United States safe, a exactly. better place. That's all they were doing was taking orders. And so he came back. So I couldn't talk about it. Just like right now, the realities are it's not it's not uh, popular to talk about being a cop. Mm -hmm. Cops have a bad name. You know, mm -hmm. I used to be proud of the fact that I was serving. Make it. Never got in trouble for being, never got in trouble for beating anybody, nothing like that. Uh, it was a great camaraderie amongst cops. Chicago PD still has that beautiful camaraderie going right now. And uh, they they didn't have as many cameras and people, you know, uh, when I was a kid, if you got in trouble, I don't care if it was a school or with the cops. Your parents took it out on you. It's your fault, pendejo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they beat the shit out of yeah. you if that's what you needed. Yeah. Uh, today, it's always the other person's fault. Yeah. You know, it's always the cop's fault. It's always the teacher's fault, the school's fault, because it's easier f than for them to take responsibility. You can't depend on cops or teachers to take care of your 18-year-old son. Why didn't you take care of him? when he was six years old and start taking care of him then. Yeah. So that that's what's going on. So it's just not popular, I understand it. So we don't talk about it much out in, out in public, you know, un, yeah. other than people that know me. And now I, uh, because of the documentary and because of the George Lopez uh, podcast that I do with him, I get recognized a lot. And people, it's a different world. Uh, I mean, uh, the director of the Netflix documentary, when he called me up and said, okay, it's being released tonight enjoy the ride. I had no idea what he was talking about. And now people are showing appreciation for me as an individual for what I did during the case, but mostly for what I do with George, you know, because it, 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 it's fun. Yeah. That, that's, that's it. So it wasn't popular back then. It is now. And I remember when the guys came back from uh, Desert Storm, they had a parade. And my wife, I, I said, she knew how I felt. So my wife went on the block that I lived on, and she put a big yellow ribbon around every tree on the block mm -hmm. uh, while the guys were there. And then they had a parade. I said, we're going to the parade. We're going to welcome these guys back. And so they had a parade in Hollywood, and it's all military, and they're coming down, and I had my, my kids with me, and everybody's cheering American flags. And there's this one group coming down, and as it came down, people were standing and clapping and giving them, applause and it was a group of males I don't, I don't remember seeing any females in there uh they're all vietnam vets mm. and they were crying and people were giving them standing ovation and then we read in the paper you know they had handouts if you were a vet you could get out there in march my wife said you could have gone out there i said no no those guys need it you know they're they're hurt ptsd yeah. they didn't we didn't, they didn't have ptsd back then but mm. psychologically they need it. Fortunately, by the grace of God, you know, I made it. You know, I'm, I'm 
I've got all my senses, all my faculties, and I got a good job. I got a family, so I'm happy just cheering for them. So they finally got their recognition, and and it's it's been coming around, you know, a little bit, a little bit, but but it's okay. I still get I still get emotional about about stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. How can you not? You know, like something you lived and experienced and changes your life. Plus, it's also a camaraderie. I yeah, mean, camaraderie, I'm sure. the build, the brothers, yeah, the brotherhood. I I uh, I tell you, in February, I was te- I was speaking in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I've been trying to get in touch with an old pilot of mine. And uh, when I first started looking for him, I was told he didn't want to see anybody, he didn't want to talk to anybody. He had P- PSTD, and he had gone off the deep edge, you know, and he turned bad, and he was using all kinds of stuff, uh, and it wasn't a good time for him. And uh, I finally got he got word that I wanted to talk to him. And so he sent his phone number through a friend to get it to me. I called him up and he was a captain when uh, I last flew with him. And he just said, are you standing at attention while you're talking to me? <laughs> and I started laughing. I said, you damn right I am. Yes, sir. And we talked, we rekindled a, and he's well now uh, doing good, extremely religious man, very, very nice man. Uh, and the first day I flew with him on gunships, he chewed me out, you know, worse than anybody had ever done. <laughs> and I just sat there and listened to him because everything he was saying was right. And that's because my gun jammed, we were hot, and you make daisy changes like orbit. And so jammed while I was going this way. It's like sticking your hand out the window on the freeway. You know, well, the links on the M6, they were coming, it jammed my gun. So I had to pull my gun in, unjam that thing while it made the loop, and then be ready to go hot the next time we went down. And I wasn't ready. You didn't do the tap, bang, bang? Tap, bang, bang. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's what they used to tell us. If your shit jams, tap, rack, bang, tap, rack, bang. Oh, you're no. Like, you fucking sit there switching the, 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 the magazine, nothing works. You're looking through the damn fucking... No, we had... It was belt fit. We just had link, yeah, belt, yeah, yeah. belt well, link. It was a link that was jammed in there. Hmm. And remember, we're firing... Hundreds yeah. around. It's hot. It's hot. It, you, you know, it, it, it was ugly, and I was, I was used to firing a free sixty like that. I was used to flying one that had butterfly clips and was on a post. Uh, so this one, no, it's free. You're holding it with pistol grips, laying it on your forearm, and you're by the that handle up in front. That was it. This two forty, or was it the saw? No, no, this was a. Oh, was it a big room? Big. Big M60 machine gun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. M60, and okay. 7.62 rounds, you know. It, it just, and so you're guiding around. Well, the the wind blew the link back in, jammed the gun. I had to get it in, get it unjammed. Try not to burn the shit out of myself. Try not to catch anything else uh, on fire. We made the loop. Second loop, I wasn't ready. And by the time we made the third third loop, okay, now I'm back in business. And, we, and when we got down on the ground, he got up in my face and, called me everything but a gentleman <laughs> and reminded me that I was part of four man crew and yeah. everybody need to do their job. If you panic, you die. Yeah. We can't afford, we can't let that happen. You got to be ready. You got to find a way. And I, he walked away and I couldn't disagree with anything he said. I just, he's right. This last time it happened to me, I was prepared. I knew better. And I always want to see him to thank him. And so I talked to him. And as it turns out, he was going to be on vacation in Phoenix with his wife and daughter and son-in-law. Same time, I was going to be there speaking. So he kept in touch through Facebook. And a guy that follows my page on Facebook grew up with my son. He's now the director of, he's now the news director for the Channel 4 NBC affiliate in Phoenix. He says, hey, can we put our cameras there? We'd like to film you guys with this reunion. And so everybody agreed. So the cameras were there when him and I met for the first time in 53 years. That's and, nice. And yeah. we cried like babies. We just literally hugged and cried. It, it was beautiful. And the first thing I said was, in order to stop this crying, I said, God, look at you. You still look great. What happened to me? Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great seeing him. Uh, the only thing I did, I, I had to talk to him a few days later, I called him up and I said, Hey, you know what? You asked me what I was doing and you asked me about this podcast stuff. And I told you, this is how you see it. I said, maybe you shouldn't watch it. 
because, you know, I know your feelings. I know you're religious and George doesn't hesitate to drop the F bomb. <laughs> I said, when George starts, well, I'm right there on his coattails and I'm dropping the <laughs> F bomb too. And he just started laughing. He says, Hey, Around my house, nobody drops the F-bomb more than me, so it's okay. I can handle it, Gil. <laughs> so it was all good. That's dope. That's, That's crazy, funny. though. Yeah. Well, the military, you know, it's a different – I'm sure the same thing in the police department, right? Um, there's similarities in the military and in the police department. Sure. Uh, obviously, uh, customs. But the brotherhood, bro, it's, it's just something that I can't explain. I'm sure uh, Gil sure. feels the same way. It's just – Well, I mean, you're putting your life in – well, but it's not even person. that, bro. He could be at a bar, and I could see him with a hat sure. that says vet. And if he's in trouble, I'm in trouble. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not going to let him not be not be by himself or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Right. Just so. people are willing to do stuff that ordinary people wouldn't do. Yeah. And, you know, when gunshots start being fired, people run. Yeah. Cops run toward them. You know, and firemen, you know, there's a fire. People run away. Firemen run into them. Somebody bleeding down there, nasty, in the hospital. You know, everybody goes, mm, mm. nurses, doctors run in Toilet. and take care of it. That's what they do. And you, and people don't realize that. So then it becomes a brotherhood. You, you protect each other. You bag each other. You do everything you can because you become just like a family member. When I was working murders, you know, I spent much more time with my partner than I did with my family. So you just become very close you know each other and you do anything you could just like you would for a friend you know so it's it's uh i wouldn't change anything if i'd do it all over again i'd do it all the same i had heard something when you talked about like when you're on a case you did st over 700 cases or something like I'm that i'm involved in uh closer to 800 cases whether oh, either i handled them or i'm an assisting unit or i was the lieutenant supervising them so it's uh individually i probably had a a little over 400 murders, you know, somewhere Damn. around there. That's crazy. Now, I, I I know you said you worked the... Um, Richard Ramirez? No, no, everybody knows Richard yeah, that's Ramirez. The, we don't want, we don't, I don't want to talk about that one. I want to talk about the ones I don't know. Like the Cecil Hotel. You, you handled a no, lot of murders in Cecil Hotel? No, no. I, that's all LAPD. Okay. The documentary that went out of, on the Cecil Hotel recently, I was called, asked if I would help them out. You know, they wanted gotcha. me to be the the talking head and talk about his hotel and i told him no i wouldn't do it it was lapd's case it wasn't mine gotcha okay and i didn't like the way they were going to do the production anyway <laughs> gotcha no the only reason i say is because it's this hotel if you haven't seen our podcast I, i'm into like paranormal stuff. paranormal stuff <laughs> oh wait. don't tell me you know momo rodriguez and no i, I know I, I know momo but i don't know him personally uh and um, aj yeah, AJ, we had he, him here last last week oh, yeah. that's right i'm sorry yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, as much as I'm into it, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fucking pussy. Right. So am I. You know what I, mean? yeah, I, don't, I don't deal with that shit. I, I was just, uh, I did a podcast with Momo and uh, Don Hefty. The Paragordo activity. The yeah. pa Paragordos. Uh, I don't know if you listened to the one that I was on. It I was, did, yeah. It was funny. I was yeah. laughing. I, I, I don't <laughs> listen to these that often. But, you know, uh, I've gotten pretty close to Momo. And Momo said, Gil, it came out fucking hilarious. So I took time and I listened to it, and I was laughing all over again. You know, <laughs> my wife would never understand this shit. I'm glad she doesn't listen to any of this stuff. Uh, you know, as I haven't told anybody. Recently, they've been trying to get me, because I've been on stage, I think, with Momo uh, two or three times now. What, on their comedy shows? Yeah, on their okay. comedy shows. I was just with them the other night. And uh, you invited, you, you know, you, you tell me about the paranormal shit. So... They're really putting the coals, putting my feet to the fire. They're getting ready to go do some house to check for ghosts. Yeah, AJ was telling us they're going to do it like in September or something yeah, like that, right? they, they want to go that. And they're saying, Gil, come on, go with us. <laughs> you go with us this time because you're a non-believer, you know what? And I just said, uh, I said, okay, i tell you what. I'll go with you just for the hell of it. I'm going to tell you right now, I see some shit that I don't fucking like. I'm getting the fuck out. <laughs> I don't care about you guys. I'm going to be packing that night. So, fuck you. I ain't sitting around. <laughs> I, I don't really care. You, yeah. asked me, you got me on stage. They were asking me one show about, just like you're sitting here, hey, is there anything? So I said, ask it, I'll answer it. And so he says, okay, we're going to talk about uh, alien shit. 
And I said, I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> so we're up on stage, and he says, hey, Gil, he says, uh, do you believe in aliens? I said, no. And he says, you don't? And he says, don't you ever look up in the sky and wonder? I said, no, I just don't look up. I don't give a fuck what's going on up there. It ain't bothering me down here. <laughs> Plus, you're a tall guy, too. So yeah, us says, tall guys, we never look up. We look down. <laughs> he says, so what's up? He says, uh, what happens if you're home alone in the house and all of a sudden you hear noise, you look, and there's an alien walking down your hallway? <laughs> I said, I'm going to jump out the fucking window. Get out. I ain't, <laughs> I, 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 I ain't white. I'm not going to sit there and question, hey, what are you doing to my question it. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm out of here. I don't need to see anything more. Yeah. And he says, okay, well, he says, let's see, uh, let's say you're still alone in your house. You wake up and an alien's giving you a blowjob. I said, well, I may have a few minutes. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. So we, 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 we did that. Uh, I, I've done stuff with them. They're a great guy, but they're into that paranormal shit. And AJ does readings, you know, and then oh. I saw him do one just a few weeks ago. And he had... Somebody would call this guy a, a big macho man. I mean, he's a big barbudo. He had a big beard going. He had his girlfriend with him right there. And he starts, you know, I'm thinking about this. And then the guy says, well, you know, me. And he talks to him more. And before you know it, he's got this big motherfucker crying. Hey, he had me uh, crying. I was crying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he, he had him crying, talking about uh, this. And it finally ended. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, tell me something. He says, oh. He says, congratulations. And he looks at his congratulations. Yes. Uh, you about to be father? Or be? And he looked and he said, nobody know. We haven't told anybody that yet. Yes, she's pregnant. <laughs> and man, I'm saying, oh, fuck. Get away from me, AJ. <laughs> I, was, I was a skeptic, too. And he came out and he started talking about my dad. Things that nobody knew, too. So certain things when we had to let him go, decisions we made with the family, and it was like, I was like, holy shit! Like, yeah, it was. He's, it was, yeah, it was yeah, he, you know, the, am I a believer? I just, I just watch him. You know, I'm not, I'm not committed to anything. You know, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm too much of an old school homicide cop. There's got to be proof. There's got to be evidence. You, you know, you, I can't go on the other stuff. So. Yeah, and you've seen a lot of things, so it's kind of hard to like. Yeah. But have you have you ever had? Well, I'm I'm sure you had some cases where you're like, what the fuck, like, well, yeah, not really, you know, I mean, how did they die or why did they die? It, or because, yeah, or, or no, nah. you, all the, all the 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 job actually becomes you know very scientific. You, you know, you look right there, you, you got a busy, busy, big street, a lot of trucks over here. If you see somebody that just been run over by a 10-ton Mack truck and he's decapitated and his body's all mangled and he's got $10,000 in his hand, you'll go out there and you'll say, ey, ey, ey. you'll see the blood, the guts, and the gore. I'll come up on a crime scene. The first thing I'll notice is $10,000 in his hand. So I, when I get to a murder, you read everything. You read the environment, the smell, the lighting, the what's going on, the wind condition, everything. And then you see blood spattering, this and that. You know, there's a lot of stuff to do. And it tells you why. You know, it's almost, if I were AJ, I'd say, the crime scene's talking to me. Mm. And it is. It's giving me signals, signs, and so it gears me where I want to go to. Uh, some, I, I, I don't think I've, I can't think off the top of my head right now, uh, maybe when I was new, where you figure out, God, how did this guy die, or how did he get in this position? No, I, I can't, because you train well, you look well, and by re repetition, you become better, if you want to be, and I, I wanted to be the best. Um, now, before homicide, you started on the gang unit, right? I, I was, uh, like everybody else, I started in the jail for the Sheriff's Department, I went out to East L.A. Patrol, and then because of my upbringing, uh, I was natural to go into the gang unit, but they were doing it uniform gangs. And I thought that was useless. They were just like a, I don't want to say like a power squad, but it was a, an extra force to deal with the gang. Gang problem, send the, the gang crew in there. And I could see I got out of gangs. I just want to go back to regular. They asked me to train, so I went, did some training for them. And then they wanted me to come back into gangs. And I don't want to work gangs. I said, why not? I said, because you're working them wrong, you know. You need a plain clothes unit here. You need somebody working plain clothes. These gangsters don't like to talk to people in uniform. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, that's where we're starting. We want you to run it. 
you know, you be the leader. So that's what I did. We started playing close gang force and that worked and we were, we were doing good and you got to get out and talk to the gangsters, you know, and they saw you no longer as a cop, but they just saw you as an adult, a different person. You know, it's like, Hey, you're almost one of us, you know, it's cool. And I knew how to talk to talk. So it, it, everything went well because of my gang work there and homicide bureau they were starting a new way to attack gang murders. They started a gang homicide team. So all you got was a steady diet of gang murders. And all the guys from Hamas, nobody liked working gang murders because it's the same thing. You know, you see, if it's a drive-by or anything like that, you see blood spots, paramedic degree, and casings. You know, and nobody wants to talk to you. Yeah. Everybody's afraid because they don't want to get involved or they don't like the cops. So they're, they're really tough nuts. So what they did was they decided, and, and before that, so you'd go out there and work that and say, okay, crime scene, write it up, let it go. Nobody wants to help. Just put it away. And you'd wait for that next one. Oh, the next one's a good one. You know, this is, this one's a robber, robbery at a liquor store, you know, white man dead or black guy dead, killed by white people. You know, there's something tangible and people want to help you. So you'd put the gang murder away and you just wait for the next good one to come along. Mm. And then they decided, you know what, let's form a gang task force, a gang homicide team. So all they're going to get is a steady diet of gang murder. So you're not going to get that next one. So you better put everything you have into this one. And that's what happened. And they asked me to go up there and uh, work gang murders with them. It, and normally, even today, it takes an average of 15 years to get up to Sheriff's Homicide Bureau. Oh, wow. And it was then, too. And I was up there in nine and a half, which was really unheard of. And I was—I think I was the youngest guy in the bureau for the first seven years I was there. That's dope. Yeah. yeah so it was—it was good. But even I got tired of working gang. It's—it's it's like taking sand to the beach. <laughs> you know, the, you the same story, just different location every time. You know, and you'd have to. And I can remember one time. Uh, what is now Cesar Chavez, right on Brooklyn, just a couple of blocks uh, west of Arizona, there in East LA. There was a gang murder. A young kid that was a promising young boxer. He, was, he used to work out as a, at the gym, and he was going to be a boxer. And he was good at it. And he's walking home, stood out of gangs, and all of a sudden the gang members got him, and he shot him. Wrong place, wrong yeah, time. He, hey, not one of us here against us. Yeah. They got him down. Poor kid. It, it was tragic. So made the case, know who did it. And one of my witnesses I served with a subpoena had a business right there, right across the street from where it happened. And I went to serve with subpoena and he's, I don't want to go. I don't want, and I talked to him, spent the time talking to him and not humiliated him, but told him, what if that was your child? Would you want people to turn your back on you? You know, you got to do this. When will it ever stop? If it doesn't stop, that's how they survive out here. And he says, all right, I got it. And he took the subpoena. He was going to go testify against the kid. I walked outside his front door, and there's a shooting going on right across the street that I'm witnessing. In the elementary school, right across the street, and kids on the playground knew what to do. They just dropped down. They're laying down on the ground. We didn't have cell phones then, but there was a public phone right there. I got it right there. I said, hey, give me units down here right now, and I'm talking them through this. Get them down here right now. And they're telling me, Gil. We got units rolling. Calm down. It's okay. They're on their way. I said, okay, good. I got to go. I hung up. Guys got away. Units went after him. You know, I told them what to do. And I go back inside the store. I said, give me your subpoena. And I got it, and I ripped it up right in front of him. You don't have to go. It wasn't worth me getting putting that man in danger, mm -hmm. seeing what I do. You know, you got to live here. I don't. Yeah. We'll do what we can without it. So it was... The gangs were good, and I did that. I got there March 23rd of 81, and in 84, I was uh, called in my, by my lieutenant, and he says, hey, kid, I understand you're trying to get out of our team and go to work regular murders. And I said, no, sir, I'm not asking to leave your team. I said I was approached if I would consider it. And I said, yes, I'd consider it. He said, well... Consider it no more done deal. You're gone. And so that's when they sent me to work. Just another team. Still, I was like, but now I could get what we called real murders, you know, gotcha. instead of just this, 
where people want to help you. And that's during the time when Richard Ramirez was hot, right? Yeah, uh, Richard Ramirez came about March 17th of 85. Gotcha. About a year after. A year later. Uh, yeah. So okay. you were fresh on the on the homicide side. Oh, yeah. That, that's why I had so much trouble. People didn't believe me. I was a young punk trying to make a name for myself. Man, and what a case to make a name for yourself with, huh? Yeah, it lasted. Such a, yeah, such a high-profile case. Yeah, it should be. yeah we, we, I mean, we've known about that, obviously, because we grew up here, and people that are older than us tell us about those cases. My mom. Even before the documentary, yeah. My mom, she, we used to live in Southgate, so she purchased her first gun because of Richard Ramirez, ah. because of the way he would go in and the areas he was yeah. you know, approaching. And she still has that gun, and she always tells me, like, that's the reason I got it. Like, you were a baby, and it's just... Your dad was working night shift, yeah. and it's like, yeah, like you didn't know what to expect. Yeah. It was. How, how did that? How did that as a as a young detective? I know you say that you were hungry and, and you wanted to make a name for yourself, but no, I didn't say that. That's what they. Oh, said. that's what they said. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Not me. No, no, no. Okay. Um, my, I take that back, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but obviously. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't say that, but everybody wants to be the best they can be at anything, at what they're doing, right? Yes. You being a young detective, how did that case, like, how was it affecting you as a, as, a, as, a, as a young man, as a young detective? Did that have a big effect on you at the beginning? Or were you like, fuck that, we're going to catch this motherfucker one way or another? Well, it, 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 was, very, uh, it was very challenging and, and very frustrating because... I wasn't getting, nobody was listening to me, you know, my theory, my thoughts. Uh, but yet I wasn't worried about being the best or working. I, I just wanted to solve a murder. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to solve a murder. This murder was no different than anybody else's death. They were all important. Gotcha. And I just wanted to get it solved. That's all I wanted to do. And I had the advantage at that time. And, and a lot of guys, if I told them today, they still wouldn't believe me. But I owe everything on, on the case in particular to a retired FBI agent who was a professor of mine up at Cal State LA. The guy's name was Robert Morneau. And Bob Morneau taught advanced criminal investigation pertaining to sex crimes. And this was a sexual deviant. And he taught me to see things that unless you've attended his classes, you wouldn't gotcha. you wouldn't recognize. And I could recognize him and I, that's what kept me going. During the case, it was so prof he was made such an impact on me. My captain authorized me to go get him to bring him in for consultation and help us out on the case. Unfortunately for me and others, uh, he was on sabbatical in Greece, so he wasn't here. Uh, probably one of the highlights of my career, my life, was being able to once he got back and we had solved the case and everything's going good, he's back. I got to go sit down with him, make an appointment, and tell him, thank you. You gave me the education. You gave me the knowledge the to work this case. And we talked about it. It was very rewarding, certainly for me to say thank you, but for him to know that he made an impact and his teachings were being put to use. So gotcha. I knew what was going on. I just couldn't get others. And there was a few guys. Uh, the guy that broke me in at homicide, uh, Don Garcia, very dear friend, uh, love him like a brother. I was best man at two out of three of his marriages. <laughs> <laughs> Don, may he rest in peace, brother. Uh, he believed in me, and he sat out in my motorhome with another another homicide cop as we listened to radio talk going on about a surveillance that I was having conducted. They believed a few. There was a handful of guys that believed in me. The other guys just didn't, and I understand why, and that's because nobody in criminal history had ever been documented at the things that I was alleging. And as it turns out, the things that he did, because he crossed the line between male, female, pedophile, boys and girls, his method of uh, the, the thing, the MO, method of operation or modus operandi is what it stands for. Uh, normally serial killers do things the same fashion. He used guns, knives. Blunt force trauma, ligature strangulation, manual strangulation, uh, stomped them with shod foot, you know, with yeah. shoes and uh, day, night. He did it all. And nobody had ever been, and nor has anybody been documented since, yeah. no. doing the same thing. So it was difficult, just like in your business, if you do everything the same way, and it's been that way, 
been handed down from generation to generation. All of a sudden, somebody come by and said, no, this is the, you don't believe them. You know, hey, you're just young. You know, you, that, and that's what I was doing. So I understand why they didn't. I just didn't understand why some of them were calling me names. <laughs> so you kind of changed, like, the whole setting there after that, right? It kind of set you know, the tone? I, I'd like to say yes, but the reality is no. Because it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. No. So I did this. And it was successful, and as it turns out, uh, my original theory was correct. And Frank Salerno in the documentary, it's the first time I've ever heard him say, you know what, Gil was right. And so I didn't jump up and down and say, na 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 you know. Yeah. My, it, was just, it was just a case. It was part of the job. So right after the case was over, we put on a – there was a conference – homicide conference and they actually gave us time to put on a lecture about the case and guys were coming up and saying god i really didn't know you know this is what he was doing yeah that was very interesting Gil. so then right after that they had uh, a serial killer going on that was killing uh, strawberries you know these are prostitutes that are working for their dope down in south la and i want to say they were calling him this maybe the south side killer or something like that and he used a 22 caliber gun, either 22 or 25, whatever it was at the time. And then all of a sudden he went from a 25 to a nine millimeter. And I said, oh, they got another one. And right away, no, nah, it's not the same guy. This guy's using a different gun. Yeah. Well, they, you know, that just told me these guys didn't learn anything from, from the you know, from, yeah. they're just, they're stuck on that old stuff. And, and it's just, that's the way it is. You know, you, it's hard to change people sometimes. Now, do you think a lot of murderers during that time um, got got away, or got, or some people might not have gotten the? How can I say this? Fuck, I'm trying to look for the word. Murders that should have been connected. Okay, were not connected because we, of the same. We people. looked. Uh, we looked at eight more murders that could have been. But there wasn't enough evidence. Sometimes the realities are in any murder. Sometimes there's just not enough evidence to convict people or get them filed on. Yeah. We looked at eight other murders that he could have been good for, but there was not enough evidence to connect the dots. So we made a decision. We would go with these cases that we knew we had physical evidence for to connect the dots. And we'd convict them on these and forget those. Those will go unsolved. We didn't want to put him here because if he beats one of these, well, then the jury could sit there and say, why can't he beat the rest? Yeah. Maybe they're wrong on some of these. So we let him go. He tells us that he was good for four more. We looked at eight. He says he was good for four more that we were unaware of, and but he wasn't willing to talk about him right then. He says, give him about seven years in prison, then he'll, he'll talk. And that never did come about because eventually he got pissed off at me and he didn't want to talk anymore. Gotcha. So, I mean, what's what's that like? How do you sit in front of this person and have a conversation? You know, like I know you're trying to get to the bottom of things, but still, it's like, damn, no, I don't know. Like the anger, I think I would feel like it's no different talking off. to him than it is talking to you. Really? So you've learned to kind of separate that you emotion. Look, you look at uh, a professional football player, quarterback for the team. Monday through Saturday, he's dad, he's uncle, he's my buddy, my compadre, he's everything. They, let's go have a beer. Just a regular guy. Mm -hmm. Sunday, he puts on that helmet and gets on that field. Everything else is blocked out of his mind. It's game time. So he knows what he's got to do to win the game, what he's getting paid for. When I go in a room, and we'll just say with Richard, it's game time. All your personal feelings, everything else goes out because you need to focus on the job. And the job is to get him to talk. If you want him to talk, that's what you got to do. You can't be making a face. You can't be cussing him out. You can't be shouting. And, you know, there's more no. Again, says understanding. You have to have the understanding. And there's a difference between understanding and condoning. Everything he did, I understand why he did it. I don't condone it, but I understand. 
And if he's the sexual deviant that I've said he is, a uh, quick lesson would be, I'll give you a night in Mammoth, snow outside, no cell phones. Just you and that special somebody you want to be with that night. And another member of society. Flickering fireplace, soft music, bearskin rug, hors d'oeuvres out on a table. And you and your special someone are both fresh out of the shower, appropriately dressed, with no children, no outside obstructions, just you and that special someone. Now, does that sound like it may turn into a night of raw and adul unadulterated sexual intercourse? Either that or I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, see, it's, it's, it's right there. So see, that is sex to you. Right. Now I give you a man that can't afford to go to mammoths, and doesn't have a flickering fireplace, doesn't have a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, he's got a bottle of white port in his pocket, and he does have a book of matches, though, and he doesn't have another member of society with him, but he's got his own member in his own hand, and he's in an act of masturbation because he just set the hills of Malibu on fire. He's a pyromaniac. And that gets yeah. him going. That's a sexual deviant. That's a sign. So... I understand why he set the hills on fire because he's a sexual deviant, pyromania could, turns him on. I don't condone it. So I knew when Richard did kids or when he, why he did the things that he did, I just didn't condone it. My job is to throw everything else out the window, sit there and do the best of my ability to talk to him to get him to open up. And that's what I was able to do. He yeah. called me Gil. I called him Rich. He called my partner Mr. Salerno. And I finally asked him, I said, why the fuck are you call him Mr. Salerno? I mean, he puts on his pants one leg at a time, just let me and you. What do you think, he was seven foot tall and hovered? And he says, no, that's Mr. Salerno, Gil. Because Richard, and I understood this, he was well read. He, would, he could tell you his words. Gil, I got an ego that will fill this room. I can tell you everything about serial killers from the time the Romans fed the Christians to the lions to modern day serial killers. And he knew that Salerno had worked on the Hillside Strangler by reading up on it. Hmm. He was studying us just like we studied him. That's crazy. You know, so go in there, hey, just show them. I don't know these people nothing. I just want to get a story, let's talk. Yeah. And that's what it was, the most vile man I've ever spoken with. But I'll sit down and talk with him just like I'm talking to you. Yeah, that's crazy. Serial killer, this psychopath, all that stuff. It's its crazy. I forgot what the stat is or something like that, but it says like there's like two serial killers at a time or something like that in the country. Right now, I, I was just, when I was back at CrimeCon, um, there was a guy, God, and I, Paul, and I forget his last name, and I apologize to the guy. He's the guy that put the DNA case together on the Golden State Killer, the old okay. man that was a killer. That's his case. He did a beautiful job, great man. I was back there uh, having drinks and dinner with a group of ladies and just people that were attending crime con. I'm sitting by myself. Hey, do you mind if we join? No, come on, sit down. We... And so we sat there and one of them said, you know, uh, now today you don't hear about serial killers. You guys are right on top of there. There ain't any serial killers around. I said, oh, they're around. Mm -hmm. She says, you still think? I said, oh, yes. Most definitely. They just haven't been caught. And she says, oh, well, I don't know. I find it hard to believe that with every, all technology they can do it. And I said, no, you got modern technology. They just study. They have time on their hand. They find different ways to beat what we're doing. I said, they're out there. And she says, oh, okay. Well, that night I read, I'm reading on the Internet, where this guy, Paul, who's in attendance over there, he is uh, – He's telling the New York Post that there's at least 2,000 serial killers, you know, in the United States today that just haven't been caught. And doesn't surprise me, and, and I don't worry about it because I'm no longer in the business. Now, if one comes along, I get excuse. You know, it's like a, like a dog that wants to work. You know, I, when this Golden State Killer thing started coming around, 
I'm telling uh, another retired FBI agent, he used to be the executive director of the uh, International Homicide Investigator Association, and I was on the board of directors with him. Great friends, good guy, and I'm saying, Bill, geez, I wish I were on the case. You know, I, I want to. You get there. you get that itch. Yeah, and he says that's because you were good at what you did and hasn't left you and won't leave you. So something comes along. I want to. I want to learn. I say, I want to. I want to work, <laughs> but it's not my calling anymore. So now I just read about them. <laughs> Do you still try to put it together outside? You're reading little clues. Yeah, <laughs> because you know what I've learned. Uh, there, there's some things I can tell right away. You know, they're going way off. But what I've learned is the public only only knows what they want you to know. That's true. You know, and uh, around my house. Big programs or Dateline and 48 Hours. <laughs> the first 48, uh, yeah. Yeah, not even the first 48. My wife doesn't like to watch the first 48. The other ones, because she likes, you know, they think they're junior detectives. <laughs> they want to put it all together. <laughs> you know, what do you think here? What do you think I saw there? <laughs> no, dear, you're, you're hey, only the, we watch we watch Dateline in 2022. <laughs> you know, they, they, they just feed you information to yeah. get your minds going because you'll pay attention. You want to see if you're right in the end. I said, but some stuff, and, and some of those cases... Uh, I can tell the very beginning, I said, that, number one, that case never would have been filed here. Number two, their interview with the suspect, I said, that shit will be thrown out of court. should have been thrown out of court. And then you get towards the end, yeah, the confession was thrown out because this and that. Uh, so I can see stuff. I like to watch it just to see how You kind of laugh work. at yeah. it. <laughs> see how cops work. And the first 48, I used to watch that because I liked it. But, and I used to watch it while I was still working to see what mistakes they're making to make sure that I don't make them over here, mm. you know, because I could see stuff that I wouldn't know. It's just not good. Gotcha. And, and especially if you watch uh, small towns like John Bonet Ramsey, mm. that, that, you know, up in uh, Colorado, that case was jacked up from day one. And you got to put the blame where it is. Local police department, you know, the chief of police, the city guy, everybody over there. I mean, they had news media in it. They let them take pictures. They let the family move around on the inside. The father discovered the baby. You know, there's just so many mistakes. You think that's because the lack of training in the smaller areas? Sure. If you don't get that many cases, you know, you, and you only get one crack at the at the crime scene, you know, you got to make it the best. There were just one the other day where this, uh, on four. On Dateline, the homicide detective that was uh, working it, this was, she had only been a homicide detective for six months. And she says, I remember arriving on the crime scene, and they showed the garage. She says, and I could see the garage was, you know, there was in disarray. There was things that were. So I walked in through the garage, went into the house, and then I could see that there was problems. There was stuff broken at the bottom of the stairway. I walked up the stairway, looked inside the bedroom, and I could see the door was partially open. I looked inside, and there was a body. So I went inside to look, and I could see he had been shot uh, several times. And I'm sitting there saying, why did you step one foot in that garage? Yeah. Why didn't you get the crime lab out here to clear a path for you to go in there? Yeah. Because every time you walk from the outside in, you take something from the outside inside. And when you walk out, you take something from the inside out. So have the crime lab go through and look for trace evidence, look for, and off, not off carpet, but on a concrete garage floor, we have something that's called an electrostatic dust lifter off this table. You step on it. I can put, you know, the, it looks like the stuff that you use for t window tinning. You put that down on the ground, you get, it's got two electro uh, rods and you put one here and one here. And it sucks the thing right down to the floor. It adheres to it, turn them off, and then just peel it off. And there's a perfect shoe print right there. Wow. You know, so you could do this. So that garage should have been cleared. Yeah. She never should have gone inside. She had no business going up there other than curiosity to look. Well, this is what I'm dealing with. And in a homicide, especially in a crime scene, you can't be in a hurry. Yeah. Now, question in that in that case Maybe she didn't, re well, it tainted the, 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 the scene because there was a murder, right? Obviously, yeah. somebody had gotten killed. But 
Maybe she didn't know there was somebody killed. So how how, oh, how no. would a detective? She, she knew, she knew? because patrol cops had to get there first. Mm. Cops oh. responded. Mm. So somebody went up there and said, hey, we got a murder. So somebody oh. already identified the murder. Yes. Then at that point, secure the, the exactly. scene. Exactly. That's when they put the yellow oh, tape okay. up. Okay. Yeah. Nobody, yeah. Goes, nobody goes in or out except for homicide. Because it's a homicide. Scene, it, yeah. It's their case. Yeah. So once, <clears throat> once we get there, okay, this is ours. We call the shots from here. Gotcha. And she should have called it. She should have called okay, the people sense. in. And if you're not used to it, if you don't have murders, if you don't have sometimes, well, hey, this is a small rural town. We call the crime lab. It's going to take them an hour to get here. Ah, we ain't got that much time. Listen, you're not going to run into darkness. Okay, well, then bring lights out here. You know, do what you got to do. Uh, I can remember, because uh, this is, Los Angeles County is a big county. Mm-hmm. and got a murder out in Antelope Valley, and it's in the desert, and it's nighttime. And I told my partner, because he lived over on the west side of town, and I live over here on the east east side. I said, okay, you're going to get out there first. Order us up. We used to call it the silver bullet. It was one of these uh, trailers, a silver old streamliner, I think they called. Get that, because the wind's going to be blowing out there maybe. Get that for us and order up lights. Get some lights out there for us. And so when I got to Palmdale Station, which was before you get to Lancaster, <coughs> and I told him, I'll just meet you at Palmdale. When I got there, he says, you're not going to like this. I said, like what? He says, I told the watch commander out there to get us some lights and the silver bullet. I said, and? He said, for us to get out there, evaluate it. And if we need it, once we get out there, then go ahead and call. And he'll call them out there. I said, oh, okay, well, watch this. And I picked up the phone. I said, hey, I understand uh, you didn't want to send the stuff out. You want us to get out there and evaluate. And he's coughing. And he says, yes. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I did. I wanted you to get out there rather than waste everybody, you know, get them out there. And we really didn't need them. I said, okay, we'll tell you what. I figure by the time you call them and they get out there to us now, it'll be just about daylight. I said, so what I'm going to do, my partner and I, we're going to go check into a hotel. You keep your people on the, you keep that crime scene secured. I said, and I'll be out there at 8 in the morning. And by the way, it sounds like you got a little, you're a little under the way. Yeah, I'm fighting this cold. I said, okay, tell your desk, if you go down for the count and you die, just tell them, let my office, and we'll handle yours too because that's not a crime. You know, that's just a one-man response. (laughs) We'll take care of you and the murder. But keep your people on the crime scene till late in the morning. Psh, I hung up on him. Then I called my office, called my boss, said, hey, this is what I just did. I said, there, and he says, okay, you, I don't care, good. And as it turns out in the long run, he ended up getting in trouble for not doing what I asked because you, you do what homicide asks you to do. You know, and he wanted to try to save some money. Now he's going to pay his people more money to stay out there and do it and you just got to do things right because you only get one crack at it and i don't want to go out there with a flashlight when i can have big power lights i don't want to miss anything so now and they will stay there and watch until daylight we don't need your lights. <laughs> so we're going to shift a little bit now because i know that you're going from all this crazy like murder stuff to now you're a podcast host with george lopez I'm, so I'm, now you're always laughing that's, that's what i do best <laughs> Uh, laughter is good for the heart. It all started because of this uh, documentary that went out. And when I learned about George, uh, I learned a couple of things about George. One of them is he's a true crime uh, fan. He can tell you all about several serial killers. You know, he follows this shit. He said he watched the documentary three times and just so moved. Uh, I get a phone call from a guy. I, when I was a kid, I used to play in a, in a band. A lead guitar player called me and said, hey, Gil. I just heard on the radio that uh, George Lopez said, anybody know Gil Carrillo, have him give me a call. Here's the number. Hmm. So I called, left a message. George eventually called me back, and we talked 35, 45 minutes on the phone, first time we talked. And it was really very personable, very nice guy, wanted me to go golfing with him. I said, I don't golf, brother. You, you, <laughs> sorry. You know, you, if I go golfing with you, I'll turn in the comedian because you'll just laugh your ass off at me. <laughs> I said, I, uh, I can't even get the ball past the windmill on the little kid's golf course. <laughs> and he just said, well, come on down. How about having a beer? I said, I can have a beer with you guys. 
So I went down uh, to the studio, and the studio's in the middle of a residential neighborhood, nondescript building, cinder block building, just with the numbers on the door. And so I went down there, opened the door, walked in. Once you get inside in the lobby, then there's a buzzer. You know, you got to call. Somebody will come up. They let me in. And I go inside, and it's a studio. And you go in a room no bigger than this room that we're in right now. And there's a table in between us. There's uh, four mics set up. And I said, okay, where do I sit? <laughs> yeah, I just go ahead and sit right there in front of the mic. And then we just start bullshitting. And that's what started it all. I mean, I had no idea what this was, what we were doing. I know it was fun. I laughed. And Bobby Lee said, uh, were you nervous coming down here? Because you're going to meet, uh, did you ever know George Lowe? I said, no. I've paid uh, at least four or five occasions to go see him. I said, I'm a big fan of George Lopez. I love his comedy. And he said, were you nervous coming down here? I said, no, not at all. Because, hey, George is just another human, just like you. I said, no, I wasn't nervous. I says I was excited because I'm meeting somebody that I'm a fan of. I said, so I was excited coming down here, but I wasn't nervous, not, not at all. And George just looked at me then and said, you'll never pay for another George Lopez concert. <laughs> you know, so I said, That's dope. And I said, okay, well, I'll get in free then. <laughs> <laughs> Save me some bucks. That started it. And we had such a good time. And he's a very nice guy. He really is. I told him one time, your persona is you're an old cholo from the streets, from the Vatican. And, and he's not. <laughs> You know, and he's just made a good living out of his comedy. And he's a very nice guy. Some of my, some of my buddies said, how can you go on that show? He's anti-cop. And I said, stop to think about what you're saying, Bob Oso. You know, 38 years on the, on the sheriff's department, and I'm his co-host. What does that tell you about being anti-cop? There you go. Exactly. And I said, he's not anti-cop. He's good. Matter of fact, we had the sheriff, Sheriff Villanueva, uh, on the show recently. You know, so he, he's a good guy. He's a very giving man, uh, and he doesn't. Uh, you know, he public doesn't know what he does. He, he's very, just a very he's good guy. Very Treats me. Uh, we hit it off, and we become friends. Uh, I consider him a very dear friend, you know, I'll, although I, it, it's different than one of my regular buddies because, yeah, we bullshit and we talk this, talk that, but I don't have any friends that are multimillionaires. You know, this guy's, this guy's got bucks, and I'm just from the bottom. You know? <laughs> I'm not used to that kind of money. <laughs> so aside from the, the money factor, and he doesn't flaunt it at all, but I but I know that, you know, and, and now uh, – We've just developed a very keen relationship. Um, and talking to some of his other friends, uh, Momo Rodriguez. Uh, Momo's a comedian. Momo helps him write sometimes and, you know, does works with George all the time. And uh, George, Momo tells me, he loves you. Because I got to believe, and, and purely speculative on my part, George is a multimillionaire, so he's got a lot of people that just want to ride his coattails yeah. and want to hit him up for a, a favor. Hey, can you get me in this door? Or can you do this? Can you do that? And I don't do any of that stuff. I really don't care. It's been a ride. You know, they said, I hope he's not taking advantage of it. I said, Take it. I hope I'm not taking advantage of him. You know, I have so much fun with him. Uh, and for two hours, just like game day, for two hours at a time, I forget about everything else that's going on in the outside world, and it's just him and I. And we've talked some very personal matters, and uh, I love the guy. And he treats my family uh, so good. Uh, first time my wife met him, you know, she said, I f he said, you know, I feel like I know you. And she says, I feel like I know you. And, you know, you I, I can't believe every time we leave each other, you know, he's always, I leave the house and my wife says, hey, be sure and tell George I said hi. And George will sit there and say, hey, tell Pearl I said hello. You know, so it just, we, we've become very, very close and it's, and it's fun. 
and he's got his own life. I don't like to bother my recently. He was in a few months ago. He was in uh, Las Vegas performing. And it was a Saturday. We had nothing to do. I told the wife, I said, hey, let's get out and play. Let's go down there just for the day. But come on. And shit, a couple hundred bucks on a on a plane ride and a hotel. You know, let's just go. And says, okay. So I looked it up. The show was sold out. So I said, forget it. The show sold out. We won't go. So I'm talking to George about a week or two later. And I said, hey, we almost went out to see you. He says, why didn't you come? I said, well, because the place was sold out. He said, why didn't you call me? Because obviously I have his personal cell. Mm -hmm. He said, why didn't you call me? I said, I don't want to bother you with shit like this. You know, hey, you're, you're a businessman. You know, you're, you're, you're a star. We'll catch you another time. And I just told, and I can talk about it because he talked about it on a podcast. When I was going to Chicago, I told him, I was, uh, he says, so what do you got going? I said, well, I'm going to Chicago this week. And he said, what are you doing? And I told him what it was for. He said, oh, that's great. He says, hey, uh, Dodgers going to be in town over there. They're playing the White Sox. I said, yeah. And he says, you want to go to the game? I said, well, well yeah. He said, well, Tony, Tony La Russa is a good friend of mine. I said, okay. So next thing I know, he called me up. I'm there at the, in Chicago at this golf tournament for the wounded veterans. And I get a phone call and say, he says, how many tickets? And I'm standing next to the Chicago. I said, Nacho, how many tickets? He said, five. I said, five tickets, George. He said, all right. Two hours later, I had five tickets in, in my uh, in my phone. They were emailed to me. And I'm sitting, I could talk to the guys in the on-deck circle. That's how close we were. That's badass. And it was bad. It was just just great. And I came back. He says, well, how did it go? I said, oh, it was all great. He says, what do you got to go? And I said, oh, tomorrow I'm going to this concert to go listen to Bretton Wood. And he likes, yeah, hey, that's great that you're supporting old timers that have been around. I'm surprised the guy's still kicking it. Yeah, he still performs a lot. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and, and you know what? He's so frail. They help him up there. They get him up on stage. And then the guy sings his ass off. He performs, still sounds good. I mean, he was awesome. And... uh that's good. I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we're going to go uh, support another guy, you know, old, another old-timer. He says, who's that? I said, we're going to be in Vegas uh, September 3rd. And he says, I'm doing a show out there. I said, yeah, I know. We're going to go up there, and uh, I've already talked to the old lady. We're going to take just take a quick trip, go up there, spend a couple of days, have a little vacation for a little fun. And he says, I got your room. You know, because he's performing at the Mirage, so he'll take care of our room. The guy gave me five tickets to go see the White Sox. You know, I don't ask him for for anything. It comes up, it's there, and he's just a good guy. And I'd do anything for him. I mean, what can I do for him? Uh, but be his friend. Yeah. That's pretty badass. It, it, it kind of sucks, too, because uh, nowadays we see statuses, celebrity statuses, a uniform, a police uniform. And we forget the human side of them. Yeah. You know, we forget their people yeah. and what kind of person they are. We just see that status or that profession or whatever it is. Yeah. Kind of sucks. But, I mean, at the same time, it's great to hear stories like that about Yeah, and, and, and Momo just says too many people like to do that. And he, he sees you as just an honest guy. You're a man of integrity. You don't know, nothing. You know, you're satisfied. And if George cut me off tomorrow, hey, the show's over with. We're done. Uh, it's Okay. You know, I was making it, I don't want to be without George, but, I mean, I, I'm doing fine. You know, I, I still got family and friends, and I've got new friends now, and so it's all yeah. good. Those are the important things, my, you know? my life, my life is My life is being good, you know, and, and it all started late in life, and uh, I owe an awful lot to George. People at the baseball game, sitting right in <laughs> front of me, off to an angle, some Mexican guy, the guy's got to be in his early 30s. He turns around slowly. I can see him, you know, like your, your your friend tells you sitting next to you, hey, don't look now, slowly turn around. Look at, the that, first thing look at that broad, <laughs> look at that broad with the big tetas back there. <laughs> and so you slowly turn around, not to make it obvious, and he turns around and he sees me and he, and he just yells, he goes, Fuck! It is you! <laughs> Kill Creo, Netflix, Night Stalker. <laughs> and I, and the guys from Chicago, everybody starts laughing. <laughs> and I start laughing. I said, yeah, it is okay. 
calm down. It's okay. Look and see, I'm just a fat guy. <laughs> and he said, no, no. And then he turns around and he tells me, he says, you know, I turned around slow. I don't know if you noticed me. I turned around slowly. You're like, yeah, I noticed. Because <laughs> I heard your voice and you're laughing. And I listened to the George Lopez podcast. I said, there's only one guy that sounds like that. <laughs> he said, and that was you. And then it was me. So he was all excited. So we took pictures and did stuff for him. And uh, that's all because of George. You know, people recognize me on the streets. I, I venture to say most Latinos recognize me because of George. You know, and, and never would add that. I get recognized because of the documentary for sure. My wife, you know, uh, she's always been the one beneath my wings. Uh, I go ahead and you know, she just goes along. She supports everything I do, everything I've done. And now she's getting recognized, you know, for her part in the documentary. And people telling her, God, you came out. It was so nice what you said. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll let you live here for free. <laughs> I'll let you continue living here for free. <laughs> By the way, that girl that we got married, we just had our 51st wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. So, it's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, but if I'd have killed her that first year, I'd have already been out of the joy, brother. <laughs> if you would have gone stuck to your plan, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Hey, Cisco, um, we're going to move on to our, uh, our no next segment. Just- or no matches segment. I don't know if uh, Cisco explained to you what he the no ex- matches. He, he he explained. He told me about what your segments were, but I'll be honest with you, I don't remember what we talked. About. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old, brother. I, uh, no, no. I can't remember if I wiped my ass this morning. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a no matches. <laughs> so no matches. You know us in the in the Hispanic in the Mexican culture. Cuando algo pasa que you you you're like no matches way like or no mames or no mames way yeah. exactly. Uh, it could be funny. It could be something that you kind of like a pet peeve. Um, so we usually ask our guests. We come up with one of ours, and then we go around the the, 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 the room and, and see what our no matches of the day is. And then at the end, we will finish off with the uh, words, words of wisdom. wisdom, and we usually let our guests say some words that they live by. And he has a good one. He told me on the phone. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna move on to our no matches segment. I know you have something to do. Uh, we would love to keep talking. He's to actually you. gonna go record. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna go record with George, right? Yeah, yeah. Amen. So we don't want to keep you from George. I don't want him to, to sue me and shit. We, 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 still, we, we still have no, George knows he. <laughs> he knows you're a rock star, too. So shout out to George. No, jo- shout out to George. George is, uh, and, and, I, and I say this with all sincerity, not because, I, I guess officially he's my boss because he does tell me, you know, and, and, and it is, uh, there's money involved now. And that's nice. all because of him. You know, not because of it. It's, it's all because of him. So he is my boss. You know, I, I call him Hefe. Call him other <laughs> things, but I call him I call him the Hef. <laughs> and uh, so the, they asked him, how did you get He said, hey, I just gave him a hat. Now I can't get rid of the motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, Working George. So he, he's a good guy. So shout out to him and everything he does for me. Yeah, cool, man. That's one of our things. We know we want to send appreciation to our community, the Latino, Hispanic, yeah. the Chicano community, because, you know, we got to represent and we got to bring people to light that do great things. You know what I mean? So if I could just get them down to Stephen's Steakhouse one time. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be done. You want to start off? I'll start it off. I'll start it off. I'll start right. off. My no manches is uh, obviously I'm gordito too, right? So I used to be in the military and I was fucking probably like two thirds. I, I, I'm two thirds heavier than two I was. Two out of three in bed, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what pisses me off, though, is buying clothes. You know what I'm saying? I said, Gordito, yeah, you, I don't want to move. Have I bought big and tall clothes? Yeah. But they, they're fucking ugly, bro. You know what I'm saying? So, like, buying shirts that are like 3X, 4X, and shit sometimes, duh. Sometimes they don't fucking make them that big. And to top it off, you're short, too. So, it's- I know. <laughs> so, if I get a fucking big shirt, it's like big. And, and, and it reaches my knees. Tall, it's, it's like a pajama. So no manches, companies. <laughs> What's up with us? Like, I'm, I'm fucking tired of going to buy it at, at Burlington. In, in Burlington instead, is the only place I can find Instead fucking... of your girl wearing your shirt, you're wearing the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my no manches. Come on, make some fucking nice clothes for us. Tailored fit? Yeah, some, some no. shit. Word of advice. I don't care. You know, I don't know what you, you know, it doesn't cost that much more. If you go to casual... Big and tall. I think they have one in West Covina. It's a XL. Yeah. It's 
Yeah, yeah they're changing. Yeah, casual yeah, XL. Expensive. Uh, yeah, well, that that's, that's <laughs> the only thing sometimes. But you, you get them on sale, and there's another store out there that simply through catalog, hmm. and it's called King Size. King Size. King Size. And they're they're not, they're much cheaper than uh, the other one. I, I, get a ca- I get a catalog, just kingsize.com or something like that. I get a catalog from them because, yes, I am taller than you. But, yeah, I do. My normal size, uh, my actual size is a size small, but I feel more comfortable in a 3X. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, I go through the same, you know, I, that's, that's right. And even now, 3X, if you go bigger than 3X, then it's hard to find. But even some of the stores, you know, the regular stores have 3X now yeah. because they realize that our community is getting larger. Yeah. yeah. And so I've been, uh, I've been this, I've been a 2X, 3X for years. And uh, so it's out there. Yeah, I get I get it. I'm a little tall too. So nah, you, buy, you, buy you, the, <laughs> you buy the regular stuff and it fits you like, Crop top, or it's yeah, like showing my belly. I can't, my raise, I can't raise my hands because I'm showing like my belly button. It's yeah. like, <laughs> but yeah. So that's why no matches of the day. <laughs> yeah, true. My no match is going to do a little bit with uh, 4th of okay. July. Okay, what's up? Obviously, I work that day, right? So driving home, just the people, the courtesy, they see your car coming. And instead of saying, okay, let me clear out of the way, you know, everybody moves out of the way, they proceed to start lighting a firework. You're right there waiting for them to freaking finish, you know, and it's like, come on. Like, you see a car coming, move it out of the way. You, that's a freaking danger right there. You can probably start a fire, burn up the car. I don't know, but it's Obviously, just like. You shouldn't work that day, dog. <laughs> I mean, it's supposed to July. That, <laughs> the fuck? That's How are you going to impede on my right to fucking burn up fucking with it, dog? Your freedom? Yeah, in my freedom. <laughs> I'm impeding. <laughs> You're impeding on my freedom of burning with this. Yeah, you got it. You, you got it. <laughs> You got no, but, but, but yeah, just common courtesy, you know, like let them go by real quick and we'll go back to since since you brought it up, I'll give you mine. <laughs> Cars that <laughs> no mom is coming on. <laughs> I don't mind, you know. I, I'm the last guy that's gonna complain about people lighting fireworks. I don't give a shit if they're legal, illegal. I was a chavalo, I came up, I know what they go through and I live in an area where no fireworks are involved. It doesn't bother me. The little safe and sane ones, they, they can do the, they can get the big mortar tube ones. I don't care. It's 4th of July. Yeah. You know, and I'm not going to call the cops. Now, today is the 10th of July. <laughs> <laughs> and some motherfuckers. <laughs> Are still blowing those big ones up, yeah. and they're blowing the big ones up. Last night, I mean, they're right around the corner from my house. I know, within a few hundred yard, less than a few hundred yard, maybe about fifty yards from my house, and these mortar tube ones are going off with big. And my little perrito, I mean, he's there, he's shivering inside yeah. the house. And I was out in the front yard in my patio, and I'm watching the Dodger game, and the dogs out there with me, and they lit off one, and I know that somebody fucked up and it went off by mistake <laughs> because it was a big, loud, it didn't wait till it got, I mean, it was a big and a big flash. Boom, it went off down on the street level Shit. and alarms, car alarms up and down the block were going off. And then I could hear people yelling, not because somebody got physically hurt, but like stupid, you know, and they're yelling and screaming. And I'm saying, come on. Blow all your shit up. Don't get fucked up too early. Blow your mm-hmm. shit up on the 4th of July. Ya parale. Just let everybody else go to sleep. Save it for New Year's or something. Yeah, you know, but just let it go, brother. Let us sleep. <laughs> let us get back to normality. Well, that's they're, they're trying to get their money's worth, bro. They yeah, spent they they, their whole paycheck on they, those. They, they, they do. A lot of money. Yeah. Take them down. Take them to the fucking desert. Take them to the beach. Take them to a park. Yeah. Do whatever you want to. But let your neighbors sleep in peace after the 4th. Up until the 4th, I'll, I'll buy you. Know, you. And then they give you their little warm-up shows a couple of days before. <laughs> let them blow. And Johnny Law doesn't mess. You know, they let the people have their fun. You know, yeah. They let them do whatever they want to do. But after 
come on. No mames. <laughs> no mames, cabrón. <laughs> no, we, we, had, we had a fucking cholillo that would do that shit at my mom's house. Well, I used to live there. Remember, I used to live in the front. Yeah. He would always, like you said, it was the fucking 7th of July, and this motherfucker's still lighting them up. This fool's in August, still fucking burning uh, shit. It was like, for real, so I was like, he would, it was fucking funny because he would go in the middle of the road, right there in West Covina, down the street from the mall, and he would light that shit up, and he'd run with his big-ass shorts and shit and his little chunk glass, hide, boom, and then walk out in the front, post up. Like, that was, that was, that was me. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, dog? Like, you ain't fucking, you know what I'm saying, uh, scaring anybody with that shit, dog? What the fuck? <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, I, I agree with you. That's yeah. a no much. It's a big no matches. Oh, so man. fuck that. Hey guys, stop it already. I do have a little dog too. I gotta, <laughs> give, I gotta give him edibles. Yeah, why? Well, I, I we we got some stuff, uh, CBD oil for pets. Yeah, for pets. You know, give him that. I used to give my last dog. I used to give him uh, tranquilizers from the vet. Well, I almost fucking killed him. I didn't realize you were only supposed to give him a whole one. And I gave him the whole one. I mean, he's all fucking loaded. Eh? He was up for a week and shit. Man. He was a row. Anyways, fine. Yeah, that's um, funny. Moving on, we're going to move to, uh, to our last segment. Um, and then we're going to, you know... We'll let you know. We'll, we'll we'll let you talk about some of the things you have coming up. Um, where they can find you, people can find you. Obviously, we know you you're doing the, the, the George Lopez podcast with George Lopez, and um, any other venues you might be coming up and stuff like that. So, moving on, uh, words of wisdom. The words of wisdom. It's like what we said. Anything that you live by, or any words of wisdom that you would like the audience to know that they could possibly use in their life to uh, either better themselves or just to live by. On a daily basis. Are you asking me now for my words? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I'll tell you. When I was a teenager, I learned uh, the manager of the band that I used to play for uh, always said, Palabras sueltas no tienen vueltas. And for those of you who don't understand Spanish, loose words have no return. So if you're sitting there and you're having an argument with your wife or with your girlfriend or whoever, and let's say it's your girlfriend. And she says, you know what? You and your fucking short shirts that you buy, I don't know where you buy them at. <laughs> you know, you look stupid. And not only that, in bed, you're a bum jump. And then you sit there and you, what? And this is, no, no, I'm sorry. I don't know where that came from. I really take it back. The fight's over with. Please forgive me. And you forgive her. But she can never take those words back. And they'll always be in the back of your mind. So when you're talking to somebody, remember, no matter how hard you get, loose words have no return. So if you're going to badmouth somebody, be diplomatic. My, and, and I've learned that. And my kids, my oldest one is 50 years old now. Uh, they've, never, they've never heard their mother or myself argue. If we've got something to say, we'll take it to a private room. We'll talk. And uh, certainly, and now... It, She's brava. She's from the bar. <laughs> I call her Sister Mary Clarence because she's a religious lady, but let her get pissed off. And <laughs> take her out of the bar, but you can't take the bar out of her. <laughs> you know, so just remember that. Loose words have no return. That's funny. Yes. Imagine you're just putting on your shirt the next morning. Oh, fuck. This is going to fucking... Or you're in bed with your wife. And it's like, oh, now, you know what? Yeah. It's true, though. Yeah? Uh, my wife said something like that, but not, not, not like that. Uh, one day I asked her, I said, hey... I, this is when I got out of the military. I started gaining weight. And so I was trying to put that small shirt on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I was like, fuck. I, I said, I said, this shirt makes me look fat. Like, right? I said, the shirt makes me look fat. And she goes, no. The shirt makes you look how you are. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> fuck this shit. <laughs> I was like, fuck <laughs> this shit. <laughs> But, Anyways, but what, well, I know what you mean. Uh, but what, what happens when they ask you that question, though? <laughs> I, I told my wife the other day, uh, she'll probably get, she didn't listen to this shit. But I told my wife, it was Father's Day. And the family, what do you want to do for Father's Day? And I've done the same thing for Father's Day for I don't know how many years. I want to stay home. I want to relax. I don't want to go anywhere. Just have my family there. and We'll enjoy. We'll eat, have fun. This year, 
her primo was inviting us down his house. And they had been over there for Mother's Day, but I was sick Mother's Day, so I couldn't go. And so they invited us over. And I said, oh, man, you know. And she says, well, he'd like to come, you know. I said, what about coming down our house? And the wife said, well, yeah, but he doesn't like to go anyplace for Father's Day. He's like people, he likes to stay home. And I said, well, that's the same thing I like to do. And I knew her brother was going to be down there and other family members. I said, okay. So I said, well, call her back and tell her this. Tell her we'll invite everybody down to our house. We can have it here at my house. We'll do all the cook. We'll, do, we'll take care of everything. And uh, if not, well, then we'll just see him at the next function. And so she called her back, said, hey, this is what we want to do. You know, how he's coming down here. He said, nah, Marty said, no, he just wants to stay, wants to stay at home. So I said, okay. She says, so what do you want to do? <laughs> and I said, we're going down, we're going down to your cousin's house. And I said, call up the kids, tell them that's where we'll be going. All, all bets are off, that's where we're going. And she said, no, you don't have, I said, Call the kid. You don't want to call? I'm in my car. Push the button. Call my daughter. Hey, this is where we're going. This is where we let them all know. And a couple of days before, she said, uh, we're home in the bedroom, and she says, you know, we, we really don't have to go. The kids are saying they would, you know, if it's going to make you happy, they, they'll stay home. I said, no. I said, we're going. And she says, well, why do we have, I said, first off, I didn't make it down there for Mother's Day, and I, and I love her cousin. You know, we have fun together, drink way too much together. <laughs> I said, I enjoy that, and I feel bad because I didn't get to go. I said, not only that, palabras sueltas no tienen vueltas. And she says, what do you mean? I said, right after you told me that, no, they were going to stay, you looked at me and said, so what do you want to do? You already knew what I wanted to do. Just telling you what she wants to do. Yeah, you're telling me what you want to do because you had to ask after I already said. So we're going for you. And now she really feels bad. And I said, don't feel bad. I said, it's not that I hate the guy. I, I wanted to go, but this is just something I'd want to do. Huh? I said, everybody will be happy and they'll have a ball. And we did, and, and it was fine. But she said, what do you want to do? She wasn't asking for me. She was asking for her. Yeah. So. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a, I mean, again, those are the words that, yeah. Yeah, you always. You, and it doesn't have to be bad, but those were simple words, you know. Yeah. So what do you want to do? Well, you just told me what I want to do. Or what do you want to eat? You told me what <laughs> you want to do. Yeah. Or the, what do you want to eat? Uh, and then you name a place, and it's like, I don't no, want that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like, nothing, whatever you want. <laughs> okay, I want Chinese. Uh, uh, I'll just eat it at the house then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my god. Anyways, I love you, baby, but yeah, you trip me out sometimes. Um, all right, moving on. Um, we want to thank you for coming on to the show. Um, I know you're a busy man. Uh, you're doing your own podcast. What? Where can people find you other than podcasts? Do you have a uh, an hit up an Instagram? I have an Instagram account. It's at Real Gil Carrillo, and I've got one of the little blue stickers to show that's really me on there. Uh, because a lot of people were writing and saying, is this really you? I said, yes, it's really me. Well, how do you prove it? I said, you don't believe me? Don't bother me. You know, <laughs> don't, don't, don't contact me anymore. Uh, because this whole social media thing was all new to me. Yeah. And uh, I went from zero to, uh, I don't know, I think I'm a little over 7,000 people following, and people from all around the world asking me to do stuff. I've done stuff for television and uh, just speaking around. You know, I was in Chicago this week or this, this month. I'll go. Um, I have coming up, I'll be in Miami in uh, August. In November, I'll be in Washington State, somewhere between – and. Uh, September I'll be in San Diego and I think in San Diego in September I mean I'll be in Coronado so just a bunch of uh, speaking engagements and see if they invite me back to Crime Con again uh, there's uh, 
something in the works uh, right now. I was asked if I would accept the nomination uh, for something going on with the Galaxy soccer team. You better. And He's so, a Galaxy You better. I'm a Galaxy <laughs> fan. So, well, it, it, it's, <laughs> Please do not go to LAFC. Oh. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to do it. I was asked, and I very humbly said yes. If you okay. nominate it, I'll, I'll do it. And something about they have a at halftime, they have a hero award. Yeah. For, so I've been nominated. Hero oh, of the game. Yeah. So something, I don't know anything about it. They just asked me if I would, uh, if my name was nominated, would I accept the nomination? I said, yes. You know, that's a big, uh, it's a big deal. It's, okay. So anything I can uh, do, and I, I just, I do speaking engagements for schools, and, you know, and, and, and those, uh, those are local schools, you know. That's all just free because that cop helped me. I'll continue to give back as long as I can. Cool. It's a good world. Yeah. You know, and they, when I retired, uh, which is unheard of, uh, and I haven't seen it since, Channel 2 came down my house and they ended up, uh, they did an interview. It got four and a half, four minutes and 28 seconds of airtime. And it was just uh, a legend is retiring. It was on me getting ready to leave the department. And I was only a lieutenant. You know, that's, that ain't nothing, you know, in the big scheme of things. And yet they gave me all that time, all that airtime. And one thing they said in there was, you know, you'd think of all the destruction and all the negativity and all the encounters he's had in life with the sheriff's department. Uh, you'd think that he'd be a bitter man, and he's not. And and then you hear me say, I haven't lost my faith in humanity. You know, so there's good people out there, just like you guys. You know, you're good, just trying to do work and make people laugh, bring some entertainment to people, and for that I applaud you. And I'm just grateful, I'm flattered that I was invited to come down here and be a part of your show. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, we appreciate everything you've done what you're continuing to do, yeah. speaking, teaching, you know, just bringing, like I said earlier, you have this big personality and just sharing that, you know, yeah. sharing that with the world. We need a uh, positive influences and positive things going out instead of all the negativity. And that's what it's about. That's what that, that reality. That's what started the documentary talk. Uh, it was because when I was approached by somebody that was a writer for Chicago PD and he brought another co-writer with him, and now the first guy is writing, he was with the Mayans uh, doing stuff, uh, Brian Gracias. And he said, want to talk to you about doing something because Latinos are always portrayed as the killers, the dopers, yeah. the thugs, the robbers. He says, we need something positive about a Latino. Yeah. And so we think you're interesting and I was fortunate enough to be blessed. Would you consider coming on the Mayans? Oh, yeah. Cool. I would like to see there. Well, if, I mean, I know Momo was on there, right? Yeah, Momo was on there. Yeah. They ain't, uh, I haven't seen too many parts on the Mayans for a clean head guy like me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could play a cartel member. <laughs> hey, there you go. Or an FBI, because, you know, they yeah. got they got uh, pots. Sure. So, you know, if somebody, if somebody would ask, I'd, I'd do anything except for go on the Playboy channel. <laughs> I don't think your wife would it too. <laughs> she don't watch it, so it's all right. But um, anyway, sir, we would like to thank you again. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your continued service, and thank you for coming on. Well, thank you. Uh, my service is what made all this worthwhile and possible. I'm just glad I was able to give back and enjoy the rewards. Enjoy yeah. the rewards, and and keep enjoying life. It looks like you are a. Like I said, a very, very full humble, life. full of life, even after everything that you've probably seen. And so, again, live your life, continue it, and thank you for coming. Thank you for con continuing to be a, a good part of our, our Chicano community, Mexican-American. You're Mexican-American, right, sir? Mexican-American. Mexican-American community. Hey, I used to stand out of the corner, so vato loco me importa poco, the sky is blue, is it? Man. Thanks so, again, man. We really appreciate it. We're that. about to take off. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you. Catch the episode. Uh, this is our, our last episode of the season. And what a way to end it with yeah. uh, a great guest. So oh, thank you, thank sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank okay. You. And thank you for the beer. Oh, no worries. There's plenty we, more. We got, we, got, <laughs> we, got, we got tequila if you want some. 
No, I got to do one more podcast. I got to do another podcast with George. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, George, take care of him, and thank you, sir, uh, for what you do in the, in the community. Yeah. So see you guys next season, all right?